Good evening and welcome to the Laughing Monkey Music Show. Today we have on Legs McNeil. That's what be his writing name you'd know him by. How you do tonight? Good. How are you? Uh, this is a pleasure. I've been reading your stuff and for years. You have um I think are you saying that I'm old? <laughs> well, I'm old, so yeah. <laughs> Let's, let's use the word legendary for us tonight, okay? We're getting legendary through the years, and it's kind of a, you know, we'll give it the positive words, positive. So, but you you are, if anybody knows about punk, says they know about punk music, if they don't know who you are, then they really just don't know about punk music. I mean, you were there, you're part of the name. I mean, can we talk about that first beginning, just kind of touch upon it for the people that aren't aware of your true punk writings and background? <laughs> We were, we were driving down, I think it was the Merritt Parkway to New York City, because we were going back and it was the summer of 1975. And it was John Holmstrom and Jed Dunn. Jed Dunn was the business guy. John Holmes was the artistic guy. And I was kind of the guy uh, who didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> so... Um, John said he wanted to start this magazine. I wanted to make movies, you know. Um, and Jed said, uh, John said, I said, well, what's it going to be about? And he said, cartoons and rock and roll. And um, he wanted to call it Teenage News after an unreleased New York Dolls song, which I didn't know at the time. That's what he was referring to. But I said, that's a stupid name, you know. It sounded like my weekly reader, you know teenage news you know um so i said well he said well what, what do you want to call it and i said punk but in all the movies and all and all holmstrom holmstrom has changed his story over the years and he says i want to do a punk magazine about punk music and punk 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 what should we call it legs you know and i said punk now he didn't he didn't mention the word punk um in that conversation at all that's important you say that because there's been a little, you know, I've read different things, but the audience is new to this. It's important to hear, you know, directly from you. you yeah. Know. Where did you get punk from yourself? I mean. Well, that's what I, I, I had been born with one leg longer than the other. So I always slouched. Mm -hmm. So I looked like a punk, but it was a physical deformity. You know, I have the right side of my body is two inches larger than the left side. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then they eventually did a femoral shortening which um, is how I got the name Legs. So, um, so how I got the name, we were, we were listening to a lot of, of John had brought up, um, that summer we were listening to Blood on the Tracks and the Dictators Go Girl Crazy. Um, and I still love Blood on the Tracks, um, but the Dictators were, they were kind of singing about us, you know, eating at McDonald's for lunch, getting drunk and throwing up, you know, all that stuff. Cars, girls, surfing beer, nothing else matters here. You know, that's what we're relatable to that age group. Mm. So John said, Oh, we'll, we'll have a, we'll have a drinking contest or we'll have a wrestling contest. Cause handsome Dick Manitoba, the lead singer of the dictators was dressed in a wrestling outfit on the cover of go girl crazy. Their first album. And um, he said, oh, we'll have, he thought it was funny that I would wrestle him because of course I'd get beat because I was so skinny and I only weighed 199 pounds soaking wet. So, um, but we can't call you Eddie. We have to g give you a wrestler's name, you know, muscle. He said, how about muscles, McNeil? I thought, no, <laughs> that's just too, too much absurd, you know? So we got down the list of body parts to legs and I thought, I thought of my leg operation. I thought, yeah, yeah you know yeah so that's how it came about and we got the storefront on 10th avenue and 30th street um right at the there's an entrance to the lincoln tunnel right there um they, it, the, the building doesn't exist anymore but but uh that's where we uh put out yeah and, and that's a huge because you led the revolution to be you know it's not this Nowadays, what people don't get, you know, with the uh, just certain stores, it's always the mall that does the punk stuff. Yeah. That's fine about buying stuff you like for whatever genre. There's a certain point you can't say if you own a certain thing because it gets ridiculous. But the truth of the origin of what real punk is and do-it-yourself magazines and stuff came from the creation of you guys. 
Yeah, yeah, it did actually. Well, it also came from the music, the Ramones, the Dictators, you know, television. Right. Patty it was Smith. homegrown. Homegrown though, wasn't it? Was yeah. not yeah. an industry. Well, the, whole, the whole scene at CBGB's was kind of homegrown. Everyone right. else, there wasn't, you know, people think that, you know, when the Ramones went to London the first time, Johnny Rotten said to um, Arturo, he said, are the Ramones going to, are they a gang? Are they going to beat me up? You know, and it was like, no, <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> no, no, you know, I mean, there was all this, people just wanted to be able to, I think it was all these, all these kids who grew up in the sixties, listening to this great music, you know, the Rolling Stones, the, the Kinks, you know, um, came of age and the music was the Eagles and, and Emerson Lake and Palmer and all this crap and Boston. And, you know, it was just horrible. So it was kind of a return to that 60s kind of garage scene and right. question mark and the Mysterians and that kind of thing. And it was great. It was great. You could drink and, and, and have lots of sex. I, I think what, what one of the things is always with, especially with older punk, was always the, you know, you become punk because you can't play. And a lot of people couldn't play very well. But there's a lot of things, there's a lot of really talented things in some punk that's underrated, like the Ramones themselves with certain down picking and certain playing they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To write a catchy melody, song after song after song, there is a talent there, you know? Yeah. And nobody like, does like punk has a catchy melody in almost every song, like a cheer, a chant, um, yeah, you know, a feel good, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah I so do. You can say, oh, I'm a copy guitar player and you know three chords or whatever. The drummer, you know, when you record it, can't really get them on beat. But the live and the energy and then the, the the honesty of the song generally is very relatable. And the whole, like I said, do-it-yourself thing was, um, it was landmark. Because with punk music and, you know, people would stay at houses, like a band could tour and sleep at someone's house. You would not gonna hear that with any other kind of music. I mean, that's a community. Yeah. And Well, if the Ramones didn't have any talent, then all the bands they inspired who tried to be the Ramones, you know, were not did not succeed you know as i as i agree i i think the ramones have a, a ton of talent yeah like, you know and like even you know joey was so underrated personally well joey could sing anything as he proved by singing it's a wonderful world on a solo album. one of the most beautiful versions of that yeah okay. yeah produced right. by daniel ray yeah yeah so i mean and that that's the whole thing i mean now what do you think do you think it's weird that the fact that People look back then and probably thought that even the punkers were like rock stars. It was about money or whatever. And it wasn't. It was, you know, nobody had money back then. It wasn't living a rock star life. You know, CBGB's is not the club that you think it's a big, huge rock place. It's a small place. Right. right. I think the perception, and I'm sure over time, it got even more of a romantic notion of what it is with how these punk guys are living. They were, they were real, real musicians living, you know, <laughs> check to check, you know, yeah. struggling yeah. and, 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 and it's not the same. And, and I think that's kind of gotten washed away. I think as history goes on, the, the, you know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe not like some of the newer bands that are kind of like, you know, on Instagram and, and setting up poses and doing this stuff. You know, yeah. when you see punk pictures, it's a photographer that was coming up out of, <laughs> yeah, you know, know. A, a young photographer that he's like 16 and I had a, a pack of stuff and I just went down to CBGB's and took a bunch of shots and learned as yeah. I went. Same thing. Yeah. yeah. Those, well, those, if you look at, if you look at Bob Gruen's photos of the Ramones, on the yeah. subway, they have their guitars and shopping bags. And that was not posed. Right. <laughs> you know, that was not posed at all. I mean, yeah. we, when I used to stay over the Ramones loft, which was Arturo's, which was right around the corner from CBGB's, Arturo would give us, me and Joey, a buck 50. We'd get a pack of cigarettes for 75 cents and a quart of beer for 75 cents. And there you had it, you know? Well, you need it, right? Yeah. Well, it's you need it. That is insane. That is, you know, it's, yeah, you, you have a, a well-known, you know, a really nice relationship with that man, with, with Joey. Um, yeah. It was a shame he got taken so, so, so young. I mean, he was, I'd have loved to see him go on and really get, get his, his, his coming up, you know, as he would have, as he got, you know, in. I, I think, I think he had to realize, um, I just prayed that, he would see himself the way all his adoring fans would, 
you know? And I think that that eventually happened, you know? So? Yeah, I mean, you know, we had a lot of demons. Well, it seems like what I've learned about him and read about him and heard him talk, it just feels, you know, he was kind of rough on himself and not yeah. realizing how important yeah. he is, how, how, what he did for other people that were like not supermodels and felt like they felt bad on themselves. You know what I mean? He was, he was the hero yeah. of the average yeah. man. Yeah, I know. And he probably had low self-esteem than anybody. I mean, and he, but he helped so many people. Yeah. Yeah, I know. So uh, to me, that's what I mean. Like his getting his thing, not being having a huge rock star, but like just him realizing the impact of people saying, you know, Joey, when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like crap. I was alone. Joey and, was you know, great. And, and he would have been like, really? That, that, that's got to be stuff that really, you know, when you hear that as an artist, it really makes you feel like it's worth it. Mm. You know? Then, so you, you wrote this fantastic book, Please Kill Me, mm -hmm. which people can still get, I believe, right? On your, you have a new website. Oh, yeah. Let's plug that for a minute. We got, you got a fantastic website. You got some books yeah. on it. Legsville.com. We will have the link below, as I always okay. do. So you can okay. check it out. I've been on it. I, I like it. Um, why don't you guys support it? You can buy books from me and the, the, the little gold seal I put in every book that says from the library of legs McNeil. And it's, already worth and it. it's, it's very cool. It, it is. And you know, it's also very cool. And I'll, I'll even write a little, little note. If you tell me what you want me to say. See? And that's yeah. still the punk attitude and it's going right from you. And if people can support you, it goes all to you. It's what, that's what the way it should be, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm left-handed. So when and the paperback version, there's not much room to write because if you're right-handed, you can write it out. Oh, okay, yeah. Left-handed, so and I, my handwriting looks like someone who's mentally challenged. I guess they doctor. I guess I am. You know, <laughs> you can break it down and get a prescription filled with it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, your doctor wants you to have this. <laughs> All right. Yeah. No, what you gotta do when you send the books? You gotta just uh, paperback, just flip upside down, and you should look narrow. So you got all the room again. Just flip it. Do it in reverse. Do it your way. You know? Wow. What Do a concept. Papers, yeah? What wow. a concept. Huh? Well, come on. Not really. But, yeah, but I don't think I don't think I'd want to get a hand sign note that was upside down on the page. Would you? I, would I? From somebody they care about? Yeah. Would it be a friend or an artist or an author? Yeah. Hmm. Just having well, anything on there. That's interesting. I mean, only because, I mean, it seems funny, a simple thing, but it's like, if you could write a nice little note or something that it means something to people, it's kind of more with that than I don't know, a personal memento means more than anything to most people, especially nowadays. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. everybody is, is we were talking, I have, we all have our own struggles and stuff, and um, you know, people have watched show, I have autism, and everyone deals with things and, and depression and stuff. And so, like music and, and, and writing and media and different types of theater, it's like food to the soul. Yeah. So, if 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 um, a note on a, on a, or a signature or an autograph or a, a note in a book is always the best or a note on an album from somebody or a, something it's it takes a little bit it's a little better you know what i mean it's a little it's a happy moment you know that's why i look at it that's why you know so first off the book please kill me is fantastic it's it's you know it's, it's the go-to book for, for punk you know i'll say it, you don't have to say it, but i'll say it. it's 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 out there it's great um okay. and, and um so people need to see that and i'm hoping people that aren't aware go there you know, there were other bands before Green Day. I'm not going to slag them. They, they got their own thing. <laughs> but to become those bands nowadays, there was, there was these bands. And these bands still hold true. And, and they're still fantastic. Um, but you didn't stop there. So you, you, you were an editor. It's been for a little bit, right? We have some time. For about 10 years. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you think about I that? Was like, a, I was a freelance writer first. And then, and then I got fired. Um, and then I, got, so then I stopped drinking in 1988. And then I became a senior editor. And, and, was uh, it a, a challenge? Because I mean, to stop drinking? No, <laughs> stop uh -huh. drinking is always a challenge. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> no, I mean, um, like being a um, going from doing it yourself, writer in punk, and then doing like spin, where also things become a little bit more corporate, a little more rules. Was it were you more malleable to the switch? Because some people are like, I can't do it. Well, Bob Guccione Jr. was not a great editor. Um, right. Or a great writer, unfortunately. Um, so that was kind of difficult. He would cut out all your jokes and he didn't, he didn't get them, you know. Um, but no, it was it was a paycheck, you know. It was going from from, you know. 
like being a plumber, you know? Yeah, I always wrote for a living. So I always got paid to write. Even before punk, Holmstrom and I would write cartoons for Scholastic Magazine. We get paid 150 bucks and we'd split it 75, 75. Um, so, I mean, I was writing professionally at 15 and 16 years old before punk. Man. I was 19 when we started punk, you know? So to, Holmstrom and I had this kind of time-tested collaboration before we even started punk magazine. And they kept writing me letters saying, I'm going to be a millionaire first and all this crap, you know? Well, the thing is, when you say like, it's like being a plumber, I, I don't know. I couldn't imagine just being like um, an author and just writing stuff for something you just don't want to write. And that's probably because I don't have that mindset. I don't, I don't, like, yeah. text, I don't like texting people I like. So, you know, God forbid. So well, I, I hate I hate writing about music. That's why I, I, I offered to do the non-music features at Spin, the war in El Salvador, the war in Belfast. Yep. I covered those, you know, I did that kind of stuff just to get out of music writing because music writing is just so crappy. And there's always that paragraph where you have to describe the music and I hate that, you know? The worst. I can never do that despite someone's music because he's like you're labeling too. Like if I have my show. Yeah. Exactly. And I don't want to label somebody. I'm like, what I hear, if I put it out there, once you put it out there, and you know, any others where people are like, oh yeah, it does sound like blah, 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 blah. No, not fair. Not fair for the artist. So yeah. Well, that's why we thought, I mean, we decided to call it punk before I'd even seen him, the Ramones, you know, I mean, before we'd I'd even been to CBGBs. You know, there's a picture of me and John with, and I think Mary Heron because she was there that first night too. We all went to CBGB's and saw, and that's when Lou Reed was in the audience and we, we interviewed him for the first, for the cover of the first issue. Um, but I thought punk was so, I mean, anyone starting a magazine in 1975 would not call it punk, you know? <laughs> you know, it was, it was like, we were trying to be kind of the mad magazine of, mu of the music business, of the rock and roll, you know, of return to it, you know. There was something special about the writing, and well, you guys, but then also your writing, because when you did carry on, you started writing non-music stuff, mm -hmm. because, of the way, because of the way you wrote music, there's only a handful of music writers I would read other stuff that they'd write, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or a lot of music books, we were talking earlier, a lot of um, Break the Fourth Wall here, music books I may have read, are good and interesting, but I don't always, the authors are not always sticking out my head for a particular reason. You know, yeah. it's, it's the story's well, and it's punctuated yeah. and, you know, it, it's good. Mm -hmm. But sometimes there's a certain, like you said, there's a humor, there, but it's like, a, it's not out there. It's just an underlying thing. You feel part of the author is taking you with them, you know, as opposed to just reading, um, you know, bullet points. Yeah. And I felt that you're one of the authors that felt that where I could kind of come across and, and read other stuff you've done, you know. And you've done like so many other books, you know, when you talk yeah. about pornography in, 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 in LA and then you, you know, you, and you've done so many other things and Manson stuff you're doing, like, you know, it's, when you evolved into those stories, is there, was there a, um, or any of those, any stories you've done, were you, was it your choice? Like, like, do you have like a desire, like, oh, you know what? I don't think this angle is being covered right. Cause I mean, like an example would be like Manson. There's been a lot of Manson. Yeah. But not everything's been done the right way. I mean, anybody can do it and talk about it, but you know what I mean? Yeah. How does that come to you? You know, I, I just write what's, what's interesting to me, you know, yeah. plus I want to, I want to find out the real story about things. You know, I want to actually go sit down and talk to the people who were in the room when a certain event happened. You know, <laughs> That's where I get my, and I, that's what I think is so cool because like Manson porn stories, you know, I've been told so many times that they don't get the truth. They just kind of repeat what's in other books. So I, I decided to, you know, go sit down with people and ask them what happened without any pre preconceived notions. Or I should say, I always go on with preconceived notions. And as soon as I, as soon as I ask my first question, my, my preconceived notions are usually shattered, you know, which I, I expect, you know, 
I mean, one of the things, I mean, on a small level, I've learned that doing this, the show with different artists and different stories, yeah. you know, because I don't edit. I mean, if there's like a, a dog comes barking in or someone's kid comes in, you don't want them on the air for, for privacy reasons. You know what I mean? You may say hi and meet them or whatever, but then you want to later on and cut that out. But I don't cut out anything of the artist explaining a certain situation, especially if it was like a, you know, a copyright situation or, or whatever it is, you know, that you'll hear yeah. cut on a magazine. And sometimes my interviews get put up and, but edited or just a picture with some title that's not accurate. And then it's like in every country, you yeah. know what I mean? And you're like, and well, just cause, and, and, the, and the worst part is cause there's a link to the video to watch it. It doesn't matter. People are going to the article and say, oh, there's a link. There's, it's like a bibliography or something. It's, it's there if I need it, but yeah. they're not even, the, the, the truth is right there and they still don't go that far. Mm-hmm. You put it in front of them. Well, I think a lot of people still read. Well, you know. e-readers and books. It's, it's got to find a balance, I guess, right? Between that and paper. No, I, I, I don't know. I, I still like books. I have 50,000 of them in my house. Are you serious? Yeah. yeah. Every room has a book bookshelves. That's yeah. insane. So let me ask you, what is your favorite book in a non-music book that you would challenge me to? Oh God. Um, the John Cale um, book, What's Welsh for Zen by Victor Bacris, mm-hmm. um, which I find really, it's really quite good as a music book because it's all in John Cale's words, you know. I'll have to check them out. I'm always yeah. looking for more. And like I said earlier, I, I'm always reading because I, you know, I do have like a tablet or e-reader. I'll have like three or four books because you can have them all bookmarked, you know, yeah. and then I'll have a couple regular books to read too. Although yeah. as I get older, the problem with regular books now is that the font doesn't get bigger. You can't make it bigger. Yeah, I, <laughs> I just want to go like this. You have to get stronger glasses. They get any I, stronger. I have. Uh, the Hubble is not going to be able to do its stuff if it gets any stronger. Mm. I thought it was we have the same kind of glasses. See, good taste. Yeah. Hmm. I've had them since I was five years old. Um, you like you, so. Really? Yeah. Really? Oh, wow. Being in kindergarten, have them pretty, pretty crazy back then. Not breaking yeah. them, what a challenge. <laughs> like, yeah, right? Don't break I would, have, I would have lost them the first day. I, 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 remember, I remember going to grammar school at the end of the year. Everything in the lost and found box was mine. <laughs> you said the whole box, did they come? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, oh, this is mine. This is mine, you know. <laughs> no, I was under under threat of life, dire life. Do not break your glasses. So that was the one thing I made sure, you know. It looks a little scratched up, but I out of forget, here. I forget who told me this, but um, Johnny Ramon came up to um, Joe, uh, the guy from The Clash. What's his name? Joe. The guy yes, Strummer. Joe Strummer. He said, we got it. We cut out two and a half minutes. And Joe Strummer said, well, what are you talking about? He said, we cut it, we cut out two and a half minutes. And he said, what do, you, what do you mean? He said, we cut out two and a half minutes of our set. We got it down to, you know, whatever it was, you know. And he said, because people got places to go and things to do. They don't have time to sit around and listen to music all the, you know. It was, it was kind of, it was kind of like Johnny's whole, um, and he was so proud of that, you know. Um, it's efficient. Yeah, they were really were, you know. He wanted to get back in the van and go get his milk and cookies, you know. <laughs> they were another person, but like back then, you know, especially for me, growing up, it was such such a relatable group of people, you know. When when did you? Yeah, I I I, I can. See I was that. born in seventy, so it was a good time. Yeah, you know, to, for for so, music for me. So when did you hear the Ramones for the first time? No, I've never thought about that before. You haven't? No. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It wasn't their first album. I was, I was still young. Probably as I got older, in the teens. Uh-huh. I was more in the teens because yeah. my parents didn't really listen to much music. So my house uh-huh. didn't have music until uh-huh. I got a chance. And then I got my own stereo. Then things changed. And I was getting music from everybody, every type of music. I'd listen to whatever, you know. Yeah. Mm. As your teen years, you start listening to you know, everything. Yeah, yeah, but that was a problem. I mean, you back then you couldn't. Nowadays you can listen to everything. You know, yeah, but no, back then no. I, I was like listen to like this new group, the Police, and then and, you know Eddie Van Halen, and then you would listen <laughs> to the Ramones and the Clash. You're like, wait, they're all different. 
exactly yeah. exactly yeah. yes <laughs> you know and and or, or vinyl and i love vinyl um where it's got like you know you open it up and there's like a story and you can feel like you're on a bus and it's a whole thing you know i know it's it's yeah. it's um it's a moment i always talk about that it's like it was better than the internet because you know you open it up and then you look and you like you know i remember like the tour pictures of the band laying on there or what are they doing spread out and then there's usually some really great forward something written about the band or especially like the live albums you know the big pullouts and had where it was recorded and what they're doing it just felt like so so gritty you know yeah and then cds you can't even read the print when they came out you open them up it's like this big and you can't read it <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and the music's just like all compressed you're like oh it's yeah. so sad yeah. right yes and now i'm sounding like that guy get off my lawn <laughs> but there was something special about that you know i love being an old guy saying get off my lawn i'm i'm embracing it i am now embracing it now <laughs> that I'm there. Well, it, hey you kids get off my yeah, lawn that's a big thing now you're doing and working on it as you get older i mean sure your opinion changes and stuff and your desires not really no i've always done exactly what i wanted to do you know really yeah that's a good thing the, yeah, not everyone's like, like not everyone thinks like that it lives that kind of life is what i'm saying you know Maybe well, plumber would. It was, I was such a weird kid, you know, like I would go to the swamp like three times a day to catch turtles and snakes. And, and I'd have to cut through where their the kids were playing, were doing little league, you know? Yep. And, um, and I couldn't, I couldn't play any sports or anything, you know, I was just too, um, incapable, you know? So, I cut through and then there'd be some father there screaming at his kid, you know, my kid would be my age and they'd be screaming like, pick up the ball, pick up the ball. And I was always like, Oh God, the poor kid, man. You know? So I, I was, I was kind of, I was kind of in my own little world and I kind of just stayed there. I think. But I, and then I, you know, added drinking and taking drugs and having enormous amounts of sex. To that, that, too. that does that does open you up though to, yeah um, you know i no. i've done a lot of shy so I, I did a lot of woods a lot of hiking in the woods with my friends it was a small group but it was you know i was never a sports person much either i did yeah. it once in a while i tried it a few times it was failed yes exactly i don't know anything about anything i couldn't do it i couldn't do a layup shot i still can oh, i can't so, i can't i'm so uncoordinated you know i can't even bowl you and can? can you call bowl? i can I, yeah i could well. i i like i would bowl because that's the one thing you could do where you could I was a chain smoker for most of my life. No, you know what I was going to say? Can you call a sport? I like, I like bowling because you could eat a cheeseburger and yes, do it at the same yes. time. And you could smoke. Well, see, I never smoked. That was one thing I never did. Oh, okay. So, Well, I like but, bowling. Too. I can bowl, actually. I mean, I'm not great at it, but I can at least fake it. I've I can't got fake a point. Baller. I don't even. I, when I see all these guys running, it's like, what are they? And I don't know what they're doing. And the gloves, and they're getting mad. I went there. uh I we wrote where once in a while and um, my grandson and family to do it. He's a little hot shot, you know, three and a half. And um, he's bowling and laying down. He's hilarious. But I'm looking around at the other people. And they're serious. And they got these gloves. Yeah. And they're doing the running and the moves and the forms. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I just watched my grandson just like lay down and roll it out and get a strike by just rolling it that way. That form seems to work. <laughs> you know? So what, so what are you, so what things are you working on right now? Like on the website. The website and um, some other stuff I really don't feel that comfortable talking about. Okay. I'm sorry, if that's no, all right. No, it's just, I'm just working with you. Hmm. You know. It's uh, I'm, I'm yes. writing. I'm actually writing a, a TV series. Oh, okay, excellent. On, on spec. On spec. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing with that. That's that's really nice. Yeah. yeah. Is it different than writing? Have you written anything like that before? Like as opposed to just like a book or format? Is there more of a challenge? Like you know what I mean? Or is it just different? Yeah, there there is. Well, it's basically you're giving directions how to make a movie or how to make something because you got to think visually. That sounds you know? kind of tedious to me, and not as creative for somebody for like you who's a creative. Well, you person. get you get moments where you can get write the dialogue, and it's fun, you know. That's that's insane. I mean, you looking back, what do you think your best piece of work is like like for books and stuff? Like what do you think the most I, I recently did a uh, narrative oral history of the Little Rock Nine. I wanted to do it as a book, but it didn't no one was really that interested. And I found out something fast. I had 
I've had this private detective I've worked with for 25, 30 years. And um, I was going around interviewing the, 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 they weren't kids anymore, the black people who were the, the, some of the major participants, Elizabeth Eckford, she was the, the woman who um, out of the nine, she did not have a telephone. So her, their mentor, Daisy Bates, who was um, a big muckety muck in the uh, NAACP called mm -hmm. all the kids and said, we're, uh, they were supposed to go their first day of school and she called all the eight, but Elizabeth didn't have a phone. So she showed up at the school by herself. Oh, and there was there's very very famous photos of her with this white mob behind her screaming and yelling at her and and that, just, and that's why that's the story behind it, right? Yeah, yeah, because she didn't have a telephone. Wow. You know, she had a TV and stuff, but I guess they didn't put that much importance on a phone. I guess everybody lived in the neighborhood, so you just send the kids out to go see, you know, Granny or whoever, you know. Well, phone so, is a monthly bill, right? TV, you know, I said a phone is a monthly extra bill. TV, once yeah. you buy, you own it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And it's, you know, but then you only, get, if you grow up in Connecticut, you only get three channels. You know? All right. True. True there. Yeah. Yeah. Until Eight, wait, three and 30. Yeah. And then the big click. I mean, what, 82, 83, finally, they got cable and you got a couple of channels. You got MTV when it used to do music and like a couple other channels, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, I was before cable. But anyway, um, so I was interviewing Elizabeth, you know, I interviewed um, Ernest Green and Elizabeth Eckford and mm -hmm. some other um, people around it. Um, and I did this piece. And while I was working on it, my private detective said, oh, my father, he, and his, he was, he's a white guy, said, my father had an affair with Daisy Bates. And I said, oh, get out of here, you know. And he said, no, really, honestly, you know. And he said, talk to my mom. And so I did. I went and interviewed his mom and his mom told me the whole story. So it's in this piece. I also found um, the How old is the mom? Pardon me? How old is his mom right now? She passed away. I did this in, in around 2000, 2001. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm like, wait. <laughs> or, or, or maybe, maybe 2004. Okay. Uh, she passed away. Um, she was a really nice woman. Um, her name was Enid. Enid. Uh, and... And I interviewed my private detective and, and um, it was really kind of interesting because oh, yeah. she, because Daisy Bates and he was, a, um, his name was um, Norman Gravilius, um, the father of my uh, private detective. Um, he was the son of a Klansman. And so, you know, he was a Southerner and um had served in World War II in Korea and been a, you know, wasn't afraid of anything. And Daisy Bates asked him to go undercover to Klan meetings in the White Citizens Council so they could get information on how they were going to be attacking the Little Rock Nine, all these black kids, you know, because yeah. as you know, information is power. So he was reporting back to her. Um, you just found out like years after he, he's already been your detective finding out yeah. other amazing stuff you're like yeah you're like, yeah. You're like dude yeah this is your yeah. own amazing story how, how did you not go hey by the way I <laughs> like like to not to have the facilities not realize that that's just as amazing story i know or not. i know that I is know. like huge yeah i know it was very cool very it's cool. kind of like a hero type of story too it was an yeah, I, know. I mean there's a yeah. lot of you know novel a lot of, a lot of complications going on in that story yeah it makes a great story yeah, the exactly. more layers to it. You exactly. have a hero that's an anti-hero, and you have a, is it a good guy? And the next thing you're a bad guy. Or like you can't pin it on him. It just makes it that much better of a story. Oh, one of my favorite books is Treasure Island, because oh, okay. um, yeah, because there's like you know with the old pirate who tricks them into going searching for this treasure, you know, turns on them. Yeah. But uh, but uh, the kid still loves him anyway because he was a friend of him. You know, it's very very complicated emotions going on there. He betrayed them and tried to kill them all, but yet the kid, what, what's the kid's name in Treasure Island? I really don't my kids' names. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. I call my kids by the dog's name. I'm like, you're lucky I'm just even talking to you, really, at this point, you know? For me? 
I said with my kids, I'm, I said, they're just like me even talking to them at this point. <laughs> they don't know their name. That's not my name. Look, am I looking at you? <laughs> We're communicating. <laughs> you know, you're not paying rent. You, you, I don't even know your name. <laughs> but I love the, I love those. And please kill me. I related it kind of to a, a sweeping Russian novel. Mm -hmm. Because in the beginning, you know, there's Iggy and there will Iggy and the MC5 and and then when Kramer goes away to jail for a large portion of the book, and yeah. then he comes out and, and 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 gets back together with Johnny Thunders and you know picks up where he left off. It was kind of yeah. you know, you know, I I I like that when characters kind of go away. I mean, I used to always read um what was it? Um God, I can't remember anything. I need to be taking my prodigion. Um, I have some right here. Advanced hey, memory uh, formula. Uh, Only it makes me really constipated, so I stop taking it. Well, and either, either never hold it. It. see, that's maybe it's holding everything in. Maybe that's kind of a thing there, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's something that's escaping to you the wrong way. You just got to kind of <laughs> exactly. I should let it out. Well, yeah. yeah. You say you're full of it. Well, yeah. that's knowledge is power, right? <laughs> So anyway, to answer your question, yeah. it was a long, it was called That'll Be the Day because that was the number one song, Buddy Holly song, yep. um, when um, the Little Rock Nine finally got into Central High in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, well, I mean, this is fantastic. I want to thank you for taking some time tonight and kind of just sure. meandering and, and sharing stuff. I, I just, you know, it's kind of important that people know who you are and kind of a real talk and not you know like i said you know some kind of spotlighted inquisition or or you know it's important because artists and, and are you know so smart and there's, there's so many other thoughts that aren't always out there when you get the the cookie cutter stuff you know as we talk certain things did inspire me like what's your favorite book because then i'm curious i you know anything that's like somebody who i enjoy i like to deep dive into what they do if it's a musician who inspired that band oh the raspberries da, da, da. oh slave blah 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 yeah. So yeah. to me, if I'm talking to someone like you, like, oh, really? This book, I have to go check this out again. Or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, I, it's been a while since I read uh, Please Kill Me. But to me, it made such a mark. Like, I can't tell you. I know it was you and your book as compared to all the other rock books I've read. There's only a few people because it, it stood out because the writing was so different to me. Yeah. Even after all these years, it stood out. So that's where it's important. It's important for people to realize that. And, you know, and hopefully they're going to, they don't know who you are, they're going to discover you. And if they, do know who you are. They're going to rediscover you. Yeah. You know? Well, thank you. You're, you're.